Okay, uh, hello everyone and welcome to the civil seminar. Uh, so today it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Um, Anna Mary Lang Louis. Um, oh, sorry. All good. <laughs> yeah. Tu ne parles pas de français, Reza. Tu ne parles pas de français. Yeah, I should learn French. Yes. <laughs> so Anna Mary is an associate uh, technical director and head of section at COI. Um, she has over 10 years of bridge engineering experience and is uh, registered as a professional engineer in British Columbia, Quebec, and uh, Washington State. Uh, she also has a project management professional certification. Um, so Anna Mary is a project manager and she leads teams on various project sizes and scope <clears throat> on the technical side. She specializes in durability assessments and service life design of structures. Um, and most of her experience is with alternative delivery projects such as design build and public private partnerships in Canada and the US uh, with multiple major bridges and signatures structures. So uh, she kind of agreed to give a invite a talk for a civil seminar and also uh, share some of her experience um, with us from moving from academia and uh, to industry. So thank you very much, Anna Marie, for accepting this invitation and the stage is yours. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me. Uh, so I, I understand that the, the goal of this presentation wasn't meant to be too technical. So I think I ticked that box. Uh, and the, the goal today, what I'll be doing today is present a, an overview of um, my career so far. I've been now in the industry for 10 years. Um, and uh, so we'll go over that. The picture you see right now is the uh, a rendering for the George Massey crossing in Vancouver. So we have a immersed tunnel, the George Massey tunnel that's, um, now at, toward the end of its uh, life and is currently planning to be replaced. Uh, and that's the project I'm currently uh, working on. So I'll be talking about it a little bit more. Um, and the title is From Bridges to Tunnel because I was hired as a bridge engineer. Uh, although I've never designed a bridge, but we'll, we'll go to that. Um, and I'm working on tunnels. So sometimes you're curating your career can take uh, an expected turn. Uh, let's see, how do I change? There we go. Um, so the, the timeline, I did a bachelor in civil engineering at Laval University. I graduated in 2008. Uh, I did a master uh, right after in 2010, uh, where my thesis focused on the influence of corrosion on the structural reliability of reinforced concrete bridges. So my thesis, at the, um, half of it was really on the material level, how concrete is affected by deterioration and corrosion. And half of it was really uh, structural with uh, um, calculation on the structural reliability. So when the concrete becomes weaker, how the resistance is affected. Uh, I started a PhD. I started a PhD in uh, civil engineering after that at uh, UBC. Um, sorry, is there a question? No. Okay. I started a PhD after that at UBC uh, in Vancouver, and I did a lot more skiing than studying. Um, so after a year, I, I mean, I did the, the PhD comprehensive exam, I did all the coursework and I was like, okay, that's not for me. Um, and, but I really enjoyed Vancouver, really enjoyed the, the skiing. Um, so I said, okay, let's find a job in Vancouver. And I really enjoyed bridges. Um, and I knew about Buckland and Taylor that was in Vancouver. So Coe bought Buckland and Taylor. So we changed names since I started, but it was named Buckland and Taylor and I managed to, uh, to land a job. Now it took me, I like to say um, it took me twice 
to get the the job I applied twice the first time I did not get selected I didn't even get a phone call or an email nothing and then the second time I said okay let's be serious so I put together the best resume I could the best cover letter I could I did my research on the company I went all in um, and that worked so I started in 2011 as a junior engineer, junior bridge engineer, uh, straight out of school, very green. I mean, I did co-op terms, but I was, uh, I was really a green junior engineer. And they put me on two projects at the same time called Parks Canada and BCMOTI, so BC Ministry of Transportation. So working for owners, it was a small team. I was doing uh, load ratings and inspection of bridges. So I did that for a year or two roughly, uh, I think two years. Um, and I learn, you know, when you start, you know, you, you don't know much. You, you, through school, I think you learn how to learn and how to think and what questions to ask. But when you start, it's a bit daunting. And what I remember learning on, on this project is really how to read drawings, structural drawings, how to work with the design code, so CSA, S6. I mean, we do learn S6 in school, but I found that in a, when you're in a course, there's always the um, guidelines, like the, the professor, the teacher uh, usually tells you, oh, this you don't consider. Like the, the problem is a lot more, it is simplified for the purpose of the course, which, which is normal. But when you go in the industry, you don't have that person necessarily telling you, like putting the bounds on the problem and, uh, and how to, to uh, so, so you need to think about all the clauses that are applicable. And, and that's where you also need the senior engineers to guide you. Uh, but I really learned to work with the design codes as I was doing load ratings. Uh, I learned how to put a calc book together. Obviously, this is something personally I learned at the bachelor level at Laval University. They made us do calculation books in our uh, project, um, but also learn to do it in a professional environment. And also very important QC procedure. Uh, every uh, deliverable that goes out needs to be checked and through, truly checked. Uh, and to me, I remember this was something uh, new for me. So for the first two years, it, uh, it was really um, a, um, a basis to, to entry-level work, but it gave me, I think, a strong basis to build on that. And after that, um, oh yeah, and I want to say I got the chance to do a lot of field work, and I would encourage any all juniors engineer to get out and go on site, do inspections. So um, this is uh, the Hudson Hope Bridge uh, in Northern BC. The BC Ministry of Transportation is the owner. And I was with a senior engineer on site uh, to inspect the, uh, the main cables here. Uh, and we were hanging in a man basket uh, on top of a crane here. You can see on the picture on the on the right, the crane, and we were up there swinging in the wind. So it was a lot of fun, but uh, I, I liked it. Um, and uh, I, I and I enjoyed being outside too. So, so I must say I had a lot of fun being a junior. And then the next assignment that came was the South Fraser Perimeter Road project in Vancouver. So at the time, the BC ministry was building a new 40 kilometer highway in Metro Vancouver. Uh, and there were, COE was responsible for 16 bridges uh, that were built at the same time. And at the time I came on the project, the design was done and it was moving into construction. And because in the previous phase, I did quite well with inspection of existing structure, they said, well, Henry, do you wanna be a construction services lead? Uh, so I was still a junior at, at that time. Um, and yet they said, well, you lead this, you, you take care of it. And uh, it was quite challenging to have uh, 16 bridges. It was all over passes, although some were more um, technically um, challenging than others. Not, it's, it was not all single span bridges, 
uh, somewhere had three or I think the biggest one had three spans at the time. Um, but there I definitely learned how to work with construction specification. So a good design is not only good drawings, it's also how you build it and working with specs. So how do you produce the concrete? How do you produce the steel? What do you inspect on site? What's the QC procedure, the QA, uh, the field reviews? What's the role of the engineer of record? Um, Who's responsible for what when there's a problem? How do you do the field adjustment? Because even the best design on site things don't always work out the way they're, they were planned to. So you need to adjust. And um, so I, I think this was an excellent opportunity to really see how things are built. Again, get out of the office, get a feel for what's, what's congestion and I'll show pictures after. Uh, what's a good concrete mix? What happened when uh, it sets too early? What's segregation? Um, what happened when, uh, I, I remember I had those uh, contractors that cut hooks on, um, on rebar. When you detail rebar, you often do hooks to anchor them. Uh, and uh, a contractor, <laughs> sometimes they come and the hook is in the way, they cut it, they say, well, you don't need it. Um, and then, okay, what, what do you do? So you really have to think, why is the structure designed this way? Um, so again, had a lot of fun. I was outside most days, long days, uh, because it was field work. And that's where I saw some funny details. Uh, the one on the left, so this is not a COE design. This was another bridge by another designer. But I remember, you, you see how the rebar is in diagonal? And uh, I think everybody was puzzled by that. I've never seen that ever again, because normally you put the rebar at 90 degrees. Uh, in this case, I don't know, they followed the, the angle of the, of the wall. This is an abutment. And this is the wing wall of the, of the bridge. Uh, so yeah, got to see a certain detail. You, you get a feel for what is a good design, what are normal details, because you see them all the time. And then on the right, you can see a congestion issue with rebar. So uh, this is a column and you can see the longitudinal rebar, they all touch each other. And that's because you need to lap rebar. Obviously the column is really, really high. And so the, you, you cannot buy rebar that are that long. So you need to, 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 to lap them to go that high. Um, and the designer had you used in his design very large rebar. I think these were probably uh, 25 or 30 amps for sure, 30, 30 amps I'm thinking. Um, and he forgot about the lap uh, splice that had to occur. And that's where we ended up with that. So obviously we did not pour the concrete this way. I cannot remember what happened. I'm guessing they did the bundles and they rotated the cage and you lap them on the inside. That's what I think happened. But um, so, so you get to see again, field issues that you don't necessarily think about when you're in the office. So I did that for, I think South Fraser, I did that for a year or two again. Um, Cause I think I obtained my PN shortly after. And that's where I was, uh, assigned to the Tappan Zee Bridge, which is now called the Governor Mario uh, Cuomo Bridge in New York. So this is the bridge that uh, Coe designed. And, um, and this is a, a bit of a funny story. So when, uh, when I, I, I told you earlier, it took me twice to get a job at Coe. And that's because the first time I applied, I, put a lot of my materials background in my resume. And that's not what they were looking for. They were looking for a structural engineer. And the second time I reply, I said, you know, I understood that. And I said, I'll just put emphasis on the structural uh, work that I've done and, and the structural aspect of my master's thesis. So I got in. Uh, but when I did the work on South Fraser, South Fraser was all about concrete. And I knew material engineering, I knew concrete especially. So uh, I 
learned a lot on Saad Fraser about concrete. And with all my background and my master, uh, I think uh, my project manager saw that I was understanding the problem from the contractor and I could really provide help there. So when this design came, the Tappan Zee Bridge had to be designed for 100 year service life. And that was in 2012, 2013, 2013. Um, and the requirement for designing for 100 year life was not common at the time, now it is, but it was not that common. And COE didn't have expertise in North America to do that design. We had expertise in Denmark at the head office, at COE's head office, but not in North America. And they knew, my project manager knew at my master's that I looked into service life design of concrete bridges. And he said, hey, and we're, you know, come and help us with this. Uh, we're gonna involve Denmark who have this senior specialist in durability and service life, but let's have somebody local that knows the North American uh, construction procedure, or at least is, has been exposed to it, which had been on, on South Fraser. So that's how I ended up on this team and, and working with the senior specialists from Denmark and learning about service life design. And because things were incredibly busy at the time, I worked on two jobs at the same time. The Abraham Lincoln Bridge was another bridge, Cable State Bridge being designed by COE in 2013. And so I ended up doing the service life design on both structures. Uh, it, it was crazy. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily uh, recommend everybody do it. But again, when you're a, uh, a junior, you're eager to learn. Uh, I think it's one of the lessons learned is you raise your hand, you say yes, and you find a way to make it work after. Um, in this case, it worked really well. Um, and I've learned definitely a lot from the, the Danish team. And we did a lot of knowledge transfer into North America. And I've got a lot of mentoring from this senior specialist in, in Europe about durability and service life. And this is why I'm going to go a little bit more technical, just so because this is what I, this is my technical specialty. Um, and I figured you, you have to learn something if you're going to listen to me for a half hour. Um, so I just wanted to touch base. This is the methodology we used on Tappan Z and Hawaii for service life design of concrete. So the FIB Bolton 34 model code for service life, which is now included in the FIB model code for concrete structures 2010 and in ISO as well. So at the time it was not common to use this in North America. Now, now it is a bit more, but it was not. And um, it was not at the time. And then for the chloride-induced corrosion. So to design the concrete against chloride-induced corrosion, we use a full probabilistic approach included in FIB, whereas for the other deterioration mechanism, freestar, scaling, sulfate attack, alkali aggregate reaction, and delayed transit formation, we followed guidance from uh, ACI or other uh, design code, which is basically an, either an avoidance approach, for example, alkali aggregate reaction, if you use non-reactive aggregate, it's an avoidance approach, uh, or a deemed to satisfy approach. For example, for freestyle, if you provide sufficient air content, you're deemed to address the problem. You, you protect the structure against freestyle. So I'm not gonna go into all the details, but this was basically the process we, we follow just to give an overview when, uh, when we are doing service life design. Uh, it follows a little bit the, um, the structural process. Uh, it, it is a rational approach when, when you follow the FIB Bolton 34 model, where the first step is you design, you define exposure zone and degradation mechanism. So the loads, what are the loads? Second step is what is the, the limit state, what do I design for? And then the third step is you do the calculation and you do the design. What's the material I need? What's the concrete quality, the concrete cover that are needed in order to meet the specified service life, in order to meet the 100 year service life? And then you prepare the project specification and you move into construction. 
And so that was the, just to illustrate, this is Tap and Z. This was the first step we did uh, in the service life process, which is to understand the exposure that the bridge is in. Um, so this is where I take the design drawing and take, you know, pens and draw um, the, what, what we think are the severity of the exposure. And it's pretty self-explanatory. Green is less severe, red is more severe. So Tappan Zee was in a brackish water. The river was brackish water and a lot of the icing salts are used in New York at the deck level. So that was the first step that we did. I won't go through, uh, through uh, all the steps. This is the second step and I'll stop thereafter. Um, but basically we designed the components to resist chloride in ingress such that corrosion is not initiated within the service life based on a target confidence level of 90%. So this is where the full probabilistic approach comes in. Um, so we calculate time to corrosion initiation using fixed yeah. law. Um, and all the input values are considered probabilistic with a mean and a yes. standard deviation. Okay, so unfortunately we weren't able to accept a copy of your password that you said that. Okay. <laughs> um, so at the time we did, oh, I'll go back. Uh, sorry, I got a bit distracted here. Um, and then for the non, sorry, for the non-replaceable component we design for 100 years. But then a bridge also has a lot of replaceable component like bearing, expansion joints, concrete barriers, uh, the paint system for structural steel. So the service life design for these component is a dis different process. I won't go into that today, but we need to think about how often do we replace bearing? How often do we replace concrete barrier? Because the overall structure has to last 100 years. Uh, but perhaps the, I mean, most likely the expansion joint won't last that long. So we need to make sure they can be replaced. And we also make a plan for when they should be replaced. So I've walked you through the first and second step very quickly. I won't walk you through the, the rest of the, of the step. I just wanted to give you a flavor for service life design, which is what I do. And also since the tap and Z and the Ohio days, uh, a lot has happened regarding service life design development in North America. Uh, because tap and Z and Ohio are among the first in North America to implement the FIB Bolton 34 methodology, I got the chance to be involved with uh, the SHARP2 and uh, NCHRP project, both initiatives uh, were driven by ASHTO in the US with the goal to develop um, guidelines for service life design. When we, when we did tap in Z and Ohio, we were all re relying on European guidance and European data. We didn't have much data in North America. And through tap in Z and Ohio, we learned a lot. We, we gathered data, we did the tests. Uh, and then these two projects started, SHARP2 and NCHR, and NCHRP. And uh, we did testing of North American concrete mixes. Uh, we worked with states, DOTs, uh, other consultants. There was really an, a research effort with the industry to make the, uh, the implementation of service life design um, easier. And now we have guidelines. I'm pretty happy to say that now in North America, there's a national guide spec for service life design of highway bridges uh, that was published in 20, 2020. Um, and I wish I would have had that in 2012, uh, but that's okay, now we have it. So now moving forward, uh, we can use that, that reference. So it was a thing that COE was really good to push, which is the development of new knowledge and stay at the forefront of, uh, of new knowledge. I'm also involved in the CSCS 6 committee in section two, the durability committee, uh, where now in 2012, we included service life concepts in the latest version of the code. There will be more change coming for the 2024 uh, version of the code. And today I mentioned to you exposure zones. That's something we're working toward to implement in the 2024 version of the code. Um, 
because like you just learned, this is one of the key steps for service life design. Uh, and again, this is something that COE uh, encourage a lot, like they, they support employees to be part of um, initiative like that, uh, code committees, uh, industry committees and, and research projects. So after YO and TAP and Z, after all these, uh, the SHARP-2 and NCHRP, um, there's now the Chacao Bridge in Chile, where COE is working for the owner. So on TAP and Z in Ohio, we were working for the contractor for detail design. On, in Chacao, we're working for, uh, so for the owner, it's, it is design build. So um, it's, it's a other way, we're, we're on the other side of the table. Um, so Chacao is here in South America in Chile. And then here you can see, actually, if you go on Google map now, you can see the center pier that's being constructed. So it's to link an island to the mainland, the island of Chiloé. And if I go back, you see it's a suspension bridge and the, main, the center pier and the water is, is right here. That's actually in the center. This one is on the, uh, I can't remember if it's the north or south. I think it's the north side. Um, so you can see here the, the center pier. And, and again, I'm the service life design lead for, for Chacao. And I had the chance to go to site uh, once or twice a year uh, for the past few years, just to uh, see their, their progress and how they're doing. There's a lot of concrete on Chacao. Um, and so what you can see here is the, uh, the uh, center pier construction. Um, the pile caps and they are PT'd and they, uh, so you can see the PT, if oh, I cannot zoom in, sorry, I thought I could zoom in. Uh, you can see the PT um, blocks here that are gonna be uh, grouted later. And there is a, um, a barge, oh, here, can you see my mouse? I don't know if you can see it now. Anyway, there's, there's a- Yes, yes. Okay, the, there's a um, jack-up barge that they call and they they send by boat the aggregate, the cement, like all the material, and they um, they have a ready mix concrete plan on the barge, and then they use pump and then they pump the concrete to the to the um, the center piers, well the the pie caps. That's the anchor chamber. Last time I was on site, so a few months ago. Um, so the main cables are going to come in here and anchor uh, in, in this massive, it's really a mass concrete. That's what anchor chambers are for suspension uh, bridges. So if I go back, because maybe not everybody knows what an anchor chamber is, these main cables here for a suspension bridge, they anchor back into uh, an anchor chamber at ground level or an underground actually. So that's what, I don't know why I have a red thingy here, but anyway. Um, this is again Chacao and that was interesting. So that's something I learned is the concrete for Chacao contains a lot of slag, around 60% slag. Uh, and when the concrete is fresh, so when they remove the foam work or if you chip the concrete, which is what they did here, uh, it's green, it's really green. Uh, this was already dried a little bit, but it's, it comes out. If, at first, everybody was puzzled, like, why is the concrete green? And we've learned that it's the slag that naturally has that color. After a few days, it becomes gray, like you can see here. So the, the gray concrete here has dried, so that's okay. But as soon as you chip it, you, you see how... Uh, how green it is. And the owner was quite puzzled when that first happened. And, and I'll be honest, me too. I haven't seen that before, at least that bright of a, of a green color. Uh, the next project, so this is ongoing, uh, I-395. So I'm again the service life lead for, for this one and project manager. Uh, but COE has a much smaller scope. Uh, which is uh, we are responsible for the service life design of the structure, although HDR is the main consultant 
and the structural designer. So COE has a, has a smaller scope. Uh, this is currently under construction. Um, and uh, so we've done the design uh, and right now I'm usually dealing with site issues, uh, concrete that cracked or concrete that doesn't meet um, the, uh, the concrete specification, something happened. Uh, so we're usually dealing with problems these days. Um, although they are doing quite well and they're progressing quite well as well, I will give them that. Uh, and they don't have easy requirements to meet either. Um, so that's what's happening for uh, I-395. And so you can see the from Tappan Zee to I-395, maybe it's, I don't know, about eight years. So it was mostly related to service life, like mostly uh, advancing technically and taking on a more progressive, more progressive responsibilities from the time I started on Tap and Z where I was the junior learning from the senior to the time now on I-395, I'm the lead uh, for, for service life. Um, and I removed uh, a lot of projects, but on parallel to that, I also started doing more uh, project management for smaller jobs, uh, which is um, interesting to get exposure to something else. Um, it's also better, I think, if you can do many things. You can write with your right hand, but if you can also somewhat write with your left hand, I, I think it, uh, it opens up more doors. So that's what I've been trying to do. And now uh, I ended up being a deputy project manager for the George Massey tunnel project for COE uh, in Vancouver. So I'm no longer the service life lead. Uh, that's somebody else now that does it. Um, and now I've, uh, I'm working closely with the project manager on this uh, tunnel. So I've never done a tunnel. I know I knew nothing about immersed tunnel, uh, but I knew about engineering in general, how we think, how we design structures. I knew the process. I definitely need to rely on the technical expertise of the of the leads, um, but it's all about asking the right questions. Uh, I've certainly uh, it's a steep learning curve. I won't lie, uh, but it's also a lot of fun. Uh, so I definitely learn, and I'm still learning about project management, about organizing and leading a larger and multidisciplinary project team. Uh, the team on Massey right now is also spread all over the world. We've got 40 people working on it at the moment, uh, spread uh, all over. Um, one thing I've learned is to chase the change through. So sometimes we change one thing on one end of the tunnel. We think, or at least I think, it would only have a local effect. And this is like, you know, you pull on a string, and it's going to change something on the other side of the tunnel or somewhere else on the project. So that's definitely um, something to, to keep in mind uh, and ask. That's where you need to know to ask questions to the different discipline leads to see how does this change affect them. Uh, importance of communication, especially with a remote team, with a team located in uh, many time zone, it's quite challenging. Um, and yeah, and learning about, uh, about tunnels. So that's where I am now. And um, I guess my reflection after, uh, after all these years is uh, raise your hand, say yes to opportunities. Sometimes you, you may think, oh, how am I going to fit that in? How is that going to work? But you know, sometimes you say yes and you figure it out later. Uh, seek a few mentors. Um, they are definitely good at helping you manage your workload, uh, helping you assess whether you should say yes to an opportunity. I say say yes to an opportunity, but sometimes sometimes you have to say no, and and it's hard as a junior or intermediate to, and even now still, to assess is this taking me where I want to go. Uh, and that's where having 
a few mentors to, to help you guide in that decision process is very valuable, I think. Uh, don't be afraid to take initiatives. Don't wait for your project manager or your senior uh, engineer, the senior engineer, to tell you what to do. If you think something needs to be done, you can validate with them and say, hey, I think this needs to be done. Should I do it? Uh, and, and now as a senior engineer, I really appreciate when I have, when I see junior engineers that say, I think this needs to be done, I'll do it. I'm like, yes, please, because we've got a lot of work. And when, when somebody sees this needs to get done and get it done, it's, uh, to me, it's priceless. <laughs> um, be open to always keep learning. Uh, even now I, I've, uh, th that's what I say initially. So I, I presented an overview, but I've never really designed a whole bridge and, um, or a tunnel for that matter. Um, so I need to be aware of my limitation for sure on the technical side and also always uh, keep in mind that need to ask the right question and stay focused on your long-term goal, where you wanna go in the, in the long-term and that may Change for a while. I thought I would remain in service life. Uh, I remember saying uh, at one point to my boss, like, "Oh, I'll never be a project manager for a big job. Like, I, I don't want to. This is too difficult." Uh, and I'm deputy PM for a larger project. So, um, so your long-term goal goal may shift, which is okay. And uh, that's it. If I go to the end, I realize the dates on the presentation all over the place, but yeah, it's probably I use a, I probably use an old template. But anyway, sorry, that's that's me uh, talking for a long time here now. Uh, thank you very much, Anna Mary. Very interesting and very uh, useful, uh, especially for our students who are uh, wondering what they will do and how they should approach their future career and what to do when they uh, nail a job there. Um, okay, uh, we have some raised hands. Uh, I think Philip, uh, you can go first. Hi. Um, Hi. Yes, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, very interesting and I learned a lot. Um, I just, just wanna ask, uh, um, before I ask, actually, I just want to introduce myself. Um, I'm Philip. I actually, I'm a tunnel engineer myself, and uh, I graduated in 2020 from Rutgers in, in the U.S. Uh, and I'm here, I'm pursuing my MEng at Western. Um, so I worked with. Uh, I'm actually with Mom McDonald's. So we did a lot of inspections and evaluations of existing tunnels in the NYC area. Um, and as I continued for, I did it for about one and a half year before before getting into my image program. Um, and as I'm doing my image program, I kind of thought, hey, maybe I want to uh, try bridges next. And this presentation was very informative on that. So I was wondering, uh, I, you, you mentioned that you were uh, just getting into tunnels. Um, as an aspiring uh, tunnel, you know, as a, as a current tunnel engineer who wants to kind of uh, expand into bridges or learn into, or get exposure to bridges, um, what uh, like tips do you have? Anything that is different from both uh, from both types of infrastructure, um, and some things we need to focus more on in tunnels. I mean, in bridges rather than tunnels, or are they similar in certain aspects? Like, how did you go about that, or like any tips you have, kind of? Yeah, uh, it's a good question, and I don't know if I'm the best person to answer because I'm not a um, structural engineer designer. I feel at least. Uh, but uh, a, a lot, there's a lot of common ground uh, in the sense that if you know how to use the bridge, because uh, I went from bridge to tunnel, but uh, if you want to, if you know how you use the bridge code, if you know how you design a structure, what is the load path and how the structure behave, I think then it doesn't matter if it's a bridge or a tunnel. The structure will behave differently for sure. But the thought process, the design process to me is the same. And we're actually now getting, uh, as an example for Massey, we are having experienced bridge designer um, designing the tunnel. At the end of the day, the tunnel is a concrete box and immersed tunnel is a concrete box. And we told the designer, well, it's 
similar to a uh, either a portal structure or actually the box of uh, yeah so well covered or uh, even because uh, our tunnel may be post tension so it's similar to the deck of a box girder a, a large box yeah. girder um, so they can definitely use their prior knowledge but it's mostly about how understanding how the structure behave i think it starts there and with the juniors engineer that's something we we push a lot on is yeah. what is the load path where do the loads go uh, why do you need this rebar there or what's what's the detailing that you need to carry the load so uh, yeah oh, i think that's the main thing gotcha <laughs> awesome thank you very much no problem okay uh iman I have a question Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for your lecture. It was great, so uh, informative and encouraging. Since uh, you talked about project management, I want to know, uh, is PMT, PMP certificate is any useful for us or not? Uh, it's a good question. I just got my PMP, actually. <laughs> I just got it, finally. Uh, I think I would encourage you to obtain it. Uh, it is, it is a bit like the, the PN, right? Those type of certification are now, especially the PMP, I can see the PMP is now being required by clients. Uh, so I would say, if you have the, the time, go get it. I would say start focusing first on your PN, that's the first thing, uh, and then the, the PMP. And for many people, um, especially at the junior level, don't be too rushed to go into project management. Take the time to learn the technical. And then you can decide if you want to stay after you have your PNG, if you want to stay on the technical or if you want to move on the PM side. Because um, I, I think the junior years is the best time to get exposure to a lot of the technical topics, concrete structures, steel structures, inspection, uh, construction. Um, th th there's a lot there to learn. And I think if anything, that will make you a better PM later because you'll have been exposed to a different range of, of projects. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay, I'm Hussein. Hello, Professor. Um, thank you for your lecture and um, wonderful information which you uh, shared with us. Uh, I wanted to know that um, I have some question about uh, that column you showed us in the picture uh, about the overlap they were behind each other. Uh, I want to know that why the, you or they didn't use the coupler in the that reinforcement. It's not allowed to use the coupler in. That it's a of... it's it's a good question. I mean, I I this was this picture was taken uh, eight years ago now, so I, I I don't necessarily remember all the details, but uh, I think in this case what happened is uh, the the designer did not specify a coupler uh okay. perhaps it would have been allowed i don't know but they did not specify it and they did not think they would lap the bars the okay. the, the designer it i think it was a um, an oversight although i'm not sure so i want to be careful what i say uh i i think the designer thought they could get long enough free bar Okay. that they wouldn't need to do that, but the supplier ended up using shorter bars that needed to be spliced. Okay, and another That's question, uh, usually when uh, expansion joint uh, should uh, change, you know, uh, uh, is any reference that uh, I can uh, see uh, for different kind of bridge, uh, what's the time of the uh, lifetime of the expansion joint? Because you know, as a, you know better than me, <laughs> always expansion joint it makes a problem in the yes uh, yeah the there, there's some information actually in s6 the com, the the commentary s6 section 2 commentary they do provide a typical service life for replaceable components so you can have a look there 
but it's quite generic. There's not that much. And I think the next step could be to look into, um, usually what we do is we ask the supplier uh, what, Typic, what is the, the typical service life of their uh, of their product? Okay, because that's where um, we get our information. Yeah, because ten years ago I was working with Mr. Dr. Larsen, who is from Danish, and now in, he is in the Ministry of Road of Denmark. He was also from Kobe. Uh, he was supervisor of the Middle East, and uh, in that time, usually it was just. Uh, site um, investigation it hasn't any code that tell us that yes in the, this time you should change the expansion joint and you should plan for the, that time to uh, uh, changes uh, is it same as that or you think uh, the code can lead us to do better mm, i'm not sure if i understand you think that if the code can tell you when to change you yeah, when they change the expansion during the exact, in exact time. No, I don't think you'll get that from the code. You'll get an approximate time, but then usually the owners will know how long the expansion joint lasts for the existing structure from experience or for a new design, we'll take information from the owner and also from the supplier. Okay, and uh, um, other things, can we uh, have a, your email? Because actually I was working 15 years on rehabilitation of uh, bridges and construction bridges and some, uh, can we? Um, yes, uh, so uh, I'll, uh, and, and we're also, I, I, want, I told Reza, like we're also hiring. So <laughs> I'll, uh, you can go on the COE website. There are postings open for, uh, I think there's a posting for junior engineers open. Otherwise is a bridge engineer open. So definitely encourage you to apply. And yes, I put in the chat. I don't mind putting my email. Um, Thank you very much. And then um, you have it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, any other questions? We have time for one more question. Sorry, hello. Yusuf, yes. go ahead. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the MBA degree. Do you think it's effective after getting uh, six to seven years experience to get an MBA degree from the US or Canada? Do you think it will take you from junior or senior to PM or it won't be effective that much? Well, I thought about doing the MBA. I really thought about it. Uh, and then I got discouraged when I saw the cost. <laughs> so. Yeah, I know. <laughs> because I don't feel that uh, uh, taking, uh, getting an PMP, it's not like getting an MBA. Oh, I, I totally agree. They're, they're different things. They're different things. And I think the MBA, um, I don't think that's going to speed you up on the way to project management. I don't think so. I, at least now, I may be wrong. Uh, I think the MBA, what I've seen for engineers that left to do an MBA, usually they don't come back in consulting. Like I, I've seen one that went into a different industry. Like, I, I mean, um, civil engineering consulting, like they went into a different industry once they obtained their MBA. The MBA is something that opens a lot of doors. Um, I, think, I think you would need to narrow down first what you want to do and then assess if the MBA really makes sense. But for project management of project, I'm not sure the MBA is the best bang for your buck. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Anna Marie, again for your very interesting presentation. I hope that uh, next time we will host you in person at Western and yeah. learn more about the projects you have been the, involved in. Uh, thanks again. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. And we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Okay.